Howdy. Welcome from the, to uh, my place here on the porch. Uh, this is Kevin's Soda Station. And we're going to go over things that uh, worry us too much. Uh, some people have a lot of cognitive distortions in their lives and use them all the time. And it's not good for you health-wise. We'll talk about that if we can in another episode. Um, but you've got to first recognize you have them to deal with them. So let's go over... Um, the cognitive check checklist that was uh, cognitive distortion checklist, which was created by David D. Burns back in the 1970s and was updated about a decade and a half ago. Um, there's 10 main distortions he talks about. Um, number one, uh, oh, let me explain a little bit. Cognitive distortions uh, contribute to negative emotions. They also feel fuel catastrophic thinking patterns that are particularly disabling. And uh, I will go ahead and share those with you. Number one is all or nothing thinking. You see things in black and white categories. If a situation, situation falls short of perfect, you see it as a total failure. When a young woman on a diet ate a spoonful of ice cream once, she told herself, I've blown my diet completely. This thought upset her so much that she gobbled down an entire quart of ice cream. I think that's the way gamblers work at it too. They lose a little bit and then they can't quit until they win. And by that time they're out of money. Um, number two, after all or nothing thinking, which we talked about in number one, number two is over -general generalization. You see a single negative event, such as a romantic rejection or a career reversal, as a never-ending pattern of defeat by using words such as, I always do this, or I never, when you think about it. A depressed salesman became terribly upset once when he noticed a bird had um, crapped on his window. He told himself, just my luck, birds are always crapping on my car. That's an overgeneralization. Number three, uh, mental filter. You, in this situation, you pick out a single negative detail and dwell on it exclusively so that your vision of all reality becomes darkened. Like my sunglasses here, my glasses that uh, turn dark in the sun. Um, and like the drop of ink that discolors a beaker of water, a little drop of uh, black goes a long way in a, a pool, a small pool of water. Example, you receive many positive comments about your presentation to a group of associates at work, but one of them says something mildly critical. You obsess about his reaction for days and days and ignore all the positive feedback. That is a number three, a mental filter. Number four, uh, let's, you are discounting the positive. Uh, this is a pattern of cognitive distortion, discounting the positive. You reject positive experiences by insisting they don't count. If you do a good job, you may tell yourself that it wasn't good enough or that anyone could have done it as well. Discounting the positive takes the joy out of life and makes you feel inadequate and unrewarded. It will also make you unrewarded if you never stand up for what you've done um, to your boss who often underpays you. Uh, number five. Discounting the positive uh, was number four. Number five is jumping to conclusions. Okay, you interpret things negatively when there are no facts at all to support your conclusion. Hmm. Of course you think they're facts, but anyway, mind reading is, is one form of jumping to conclusions. Without checking it out, you arbitrarily conclude that someone is negatively reacting to you. Maybe they're not. Maybe it's totally something else. And you should accept their explanation if that's the case. Uh, fortune telling. You predict things that will turn out badly before a test. Uh, you know, you may tell yourself, I'm really going to blow it. What if I flunk? If you're depressed, you may tell yourself, I'll never get better. So jumping to conclusions, that's number five, is broken down into mind reading and fortune telling. Number six is called magnification. This is when you exaggerate the importance of your problems and shortcomings, or you minimize the importance of your desirable 
qualities. This is also called the binocular trick. Okay, uh, somebody with, with uh, binoculars would normally uh, focus on uh, many things if they're looking far away, but if they're close up, they hyper focus on what's close. And that's the way you make yourself uh, see things magnified. Number seven, emotional reasoning. Uh, you assume that your negative emotions necessarily reflect the way things really are. I feel terrified about going on airplanes. It must be very dangerous to fly just because I feel that way. Or I feel guilty. I must be a rotten person. Or I feel angry. That proves I'm uh, treating, treated unfairly. Or I feel so, so inferior. This means I'm a second-rate person. Or I feel hopeless. I must really be hopeless permanently you know um, this is what emotional reason is going to, from the gut all the time number eight is should statements you tell yourself the things that you should be doing or the should you weigh or the way you should be uh, expected to do them or be after playing a difficult piece on the piano, a gifted pianist told herself, I shouldn't have made so many mistakes. This made her feel so disgusted that she quit practicing for several days. Must, oughts, and have tos are similar offenders. Should statements that are directed against yourself lead to guilt and frustration. Should statements that are directed against other people or the world in general lead to anger and frustration. He shouldn't be so stubborn and argumentative. Many people try to motivate themselves with should and shouldn'ts, as if they were delinquents who had to be punished before they could be expected to do anything. I shouldn't eat that donut. This usually doesn't work because all these should and must make you feel rebellious and you get the urge to do just the opposite. Dr. Albert Ellis has called this m uh, masturbation. I call it shouldy approach to life. I must do this, and then you condemn yourself for not doing it. Labeling is number nine, after should statements. Labeling. Labeling is an extreme form of all or nothing thinking. Instead of saying, I made a mistake, you attach a negative label to yourself, I'm a loser. You might also label yourself a fool, or a failure, or a jerk. Labeling is quite irrational because you are not the same as what you do. Again, you are not the same as what you do. Human beings exist, but fools, losers, and jerks do not. These labels are just useless abstractions that lead to anger, anxiety, frustration, and low self-esteem. You may also label others. When someone does something that rubs you the wrong way, you may tell yourself, he's an SOB, or I could call him a donkey. All right, then you feel that the problem is with the person's character or essence instead of with their thinking or behavior. Now, their thinking and behavior is not the person, right? You see them as totally bad, like Donald Trump. I'm sorry, Donald. This makes you feel hostile and hopeless with, about improving things and leaves little room for constructive communication. And that's what Donald Trump does, so don't mirror him. He labels a lot and uh, condemns a lot and we need not to be that way uh, that was labeling number 10 is personalization and blame personalization personalization occurs when you hold yourself personally responsible for an event that isn't entirely under your control when a woman received a note that her child was having difficulties at school she told herself this shows what a bad mother i am Instead of trying to pinpoint the cause of the problem so that she could be helpful to her child, hmm, so you leave out the helpfulness when you're personalizing blame. When another woman's husband beat her, she told herself, if only I were better in bed, he wouldn't beat me. Personalization leads to guilt, shame, and feelings of inadequacy. Some people do the opposite. They blame other people or their circumstances for their problems and they overlook ways that they might be contributing to the problem. The reason my marriage is so lousy is because my spouse is totally unreasonable. You say, blame usually doesn't work very well because the other person will resent being scapegoated and they will just toss the blame right back in your lap. 
Hmm. It's like the game of hot potato. No one wants to get stuck with it. Personalization and blame. All right, we have to seize the day and do better. Uh, this is a summary by um, uh, uh, Dr. Burns and it's a feeling good handbook. But uh, the checklist that we just used came from uh, David D. Burns, as I noted, MD, uh, originally in the 1970s, and it stuck with us. It's still around in 2020. I was given this, and I suggest you uh, considering looking up a checklist of cognitive distortions and seeing what you can work on. Just choose one. Make sure you recognize that's one I need to work on. I'm, I'm constantly moving to that uh, frame. The frame is what controls your thinking and, uh, and your mood. And don't let your mood control your frame. Um, those are cognitive distortions. Uh, we do have to investigate things when we don't understand them. And I suggest uh, this is one place you can start. Uh, do your own cognitive checklist and decide which distortions you want to want to uh, start leaving out of your life. And uh, in order to solve problems with others and to get along and to achieve. All right. This is particularly important in COVID-19 uh, era because we're so isolated and we need to use this time to reflect and um, be mindful and yeah, change your heart, change your head, but don't blame. See ya. Again, this is Kevin Soda at the Kevin Soda channel and I trust you like this program and hope to see you again. If you have questions or comments, please put them in the uh, peace below.